This is a Danger Entertainment podcast. DangerEntertainment.net. Danger Entertainment Podcast Network. Please note that any comments, jokes, questions, maybe, anything that we say on the History of Bad Ideas is all in good fun. And remember, we insult everybody. Our thoughts, opinions, questions, anything else, actions that we do on the show do not reflect any of our employers, organizations, advertisers, or anyone else that is associated with the history of bad ideas. And remember, at the end of the day, it's just a joke. Listeners, and welcome to this special fireside holiday interview chat with writer and producer Ben Riggs, who's my new best friend but doesn't know it yet. Thanks for listening. This is about a one hour interview. It was my first one going solo all by myself, and Ben was a very good uh, sport as he put up with my technical difficulties and my rambling questions, tangents, and interruptions. But overall, if you like TSR, Dungeons and Dragons, role playing games, and uh, Walking Trees like Jason, maybe you should give this one a good listen to. It's a little less than an hour. Hope you enjoy it. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. And uh, hello, Hobie fans. Uh, This is Blake, and uh, today we have a special guest interview with Ben Riggs. According to his business card, he is a writer-producer. He is the host of the podcast Plot Points, He is an author who has written a book called Encounter Theory, the Adventure Design Workbook. Uh, He's had several uh, articles published. Uh, You can find his um, uh, articles on places such as Geek and Sundry. And essentially, basically, an RPG everyman. Hello, Ben. How are you doing? Hey, Blake. Thanks for having me on. It's my pleasure. Honestly, it's uh, I'm very excited and maybe a little nervous as uh, <laughs> as uh, a lot of people will listen saying, hey, what's, that's not how Blake normally sounds. But um, I'm very excited. This goes back all the way to Gen Con in August of this year uh, when I usually get to go to Gen Con and I get to see and play you know, all kinds of games. I've been going there for several years ever since I became a uh, a functioning adult living back in the United States, and I can actually afford to go to places like that. And I usually try to get a number of seminars because I'm always looking for something better, something educational, something that I can come across. And so I sat through my first seminar, and it was essentially mostly for uh, beginning dungeon masters, people running games. And uh, the seminar immediately afterwards was this gentleman by the name of Ben Riggs, and I think your first uh, seminar was the was the actual and was it the Encounter Theory? Yep, yep that was the Encounter yes, Theory it seminar. It was the the Encounter Theory seminar, and I listened to that and you, and I was like, yeah, hey, I like this guy. And you said, oh, by the way, I've got these other seminars coming up, and I was like, <laughs> all right, what are these? And basically, those were third edition D and D creation of a masterpiece, and I said. I like this guy even better. And then your next one is why TSR failed. I said, I don't know what to do. And then the TSR West, you know, the hope and tragedy. I was like, well, son of a gun, I really need to go see these. So uh, if it's any consolation to you, make you feel better. I actually dished a game so I can go see those other uh, other seminars. That, that is a high compliment. Uh, Gen Con is prime time for gaming. So if you're going to ditch a game, that's that says something. Yeah, so, and I'm also very, you know, pretty picky. But uh, fortunately, the games I did ditch, 
were the uh, backup ones because I didn't get in the ones that I really wanted. To. Oh, okay, that's better. So I don't know how you're gonna take that. But. <laughs> I'll t- I'll take every compliment I can get, sir. <laughs> no, but seriously, um, I was pretty excited to go listen to you and uh, do your seminars. And so, what the the first thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, you are an accomplished author. You do have a, a book that is out there on Drive Through RPG. Uh, it's called Encounter Theory: The Adventure Design Workbook. And um, it's a very interesting uh, piece of work. I like it. Uh, you essentially basically looked at RPG games and said, what makes good encounters? What makes good games? And you've laid out your theory in your seminars. And uh, essentially, a counter theory. I agree with a lot of things that you said. There are a number of times when as a DM, I'm going through and I'm looking at games and they'll have like the random encounters. And it's kind of funny that you use the random encounter example of the vampire in the, in the caves. Yeah. That's, that's a Tracy Hickman uh, example from back in the day. Yeah. Yes. And I have, you know, when I go back through my old, you know, you know, first edition, AD and D second edition, and I'm converting them to, you know, games that I play nowadays, I'm still, still a stickler for 3.5. You know, I'm one of those, uh, (laughs) you know, like bah humbug, 3.5. 3.5. But we can talk about that later. But the encounter theory, random encounters. I never understood some of the random encounters in the tables. You know, I, I sat there and I look at this, and especially as a DM, when you got the group and you got the party, you have the objectives, you got the underlying, you know, plot lines and stories, and you want to get them from point A to point B, but you want to make it interesting. And then they throw in these, you know, random encounters that some of these just don't make sense and they don't really perpetuate the game further or forward. So I'm um, encounter theory, adventure design workbook. Explain to me how you decided to come along to design that and write it and what you wanted to make better. So uh, my podcast, uh, Plot Points, we started out by saying we were the podcast that uh, – treats role-playing games like literature and then after doing it for six years we had a revelation which was role playings role-playing games are not literature they are literary but they are not literature and uh that got me thinking a little bit deeper about role-playing games and what they were because role-playing games are very new we we are still grappling with the newness of the role-playing game form um i think it was robin laws who said that if you were to trace the history of role-playing games and put it along the su- alongside the history of film, we are just past the introduction of sound in the history of uh, role-playing games. So there's still a lot of territory and space out there uh, to explore. And one of the things that occurred to me in reading adventure after adventure after adventure from my other podcast is that there's a lot of stuff in adventures that you don't need. Um And as a matter of fact, uh, oftentimes putting less in makes them better. And, you you know, if you have a uh, and furthermore, another thing that drove me crazy was you would have genius game designers uh, who couldn't write good adventures. Um, Mm -hmm. Why is it that uh, Mark Reinhagen and Lisa Stevens could create Vampire the Masquerade, uh, but then the adventure in the second edition Vampire the Masquerade core book is no good at all? Um, Mm -hmm. Why is it that like we have so many D and D, A D and D, and third edition adventures out there, but how many of them are really excellent? And uh, so the first thing I did was I looked at adventures that I thought were truly, truly excellent, like the first edition uh, Ravenloft game by Tracy and Laura Hickman, uh, and uh, that I feel like that is a touchstone for me, and the Dracula dossier by Ken Height and Gareth Ryder Hanrahan, because they're mm-hmm. very different. One is a first edition kind of dungeon crawl. The other is a uh, improvisational campaign using a, a fairly freeform system, the gumshoe engine. And maybe they would agree it's freeform, but that's a, a different thing. Uh, so, yes. Now, now if, at, I could, if I could stop you real yeah, quick. Hey, I, what, I started just feeling. Please, feel free to stop. <laughs> no, I, I, I ask Jason in the podcast. I interrupt him all the time. The uh, what really had me with your train of thought was when you talked about Ravenloft being such a great adventure, and uh, essentially the the thought of the, the you know the contained sandbox that you that you discuss. And if people want to go listen to it uh, for this Thanksgiving, you took off for plot points, and you and your two cohorts, um, the gentleman and the lady, uh, <laughs> Brad and Sarah, Brad and Sarah, uh, you guys basically that was your first podcast yeah, the first episode, break down the first edition ravenloft yep 
first episode we ever did was doing a deep dive on the first edition uh, Ravenloft adventure. And mm-hmm. the reason that that really stuck out in my mind as being amazing is it, it is this contained sandbox. Like once you, you're, you're, you, it starts out in a tavern and you're told, hey, there's an evil uh, uh, count, go kill him. And you're like, okay, this is D&D. That's what I'm going to do. Off you go. You enter some gates. And once you enter the gates, uh, you cannot leave until he is dead. But within those gates, you have total freedom. You can go anywhere and do anything. And uh, the the adventure is even replayable, which makes it even more engaging. And I I could uh, expound at length on how well written it is, but I won't. But it really made me realize that, like, if you're going to design good adventures, which is what uh, encounter theory is all about designing better adventures. One of the things that you should really do is make sure that players have total freedom. Your job as a game designer or adventure writer or DM is not to tell players what they're going to do. You don't write a story. Uh, You need to give them total freedom to to deal with every problem they come across and treat them harshly. Like they come to the table expecting assassinations and murders and seductions. Uh, You don't need to figure out how they're going to solve a problem. You just need to put the problem in their, in their way. Now this of course, and Mm -hmm. again, stop me if I'm spilling too much, but this presents problems of its own. We're like, okay, if I'm going to give people total freedom and treat them harshly, how on Mm -hmm. earth am I going to write an adventure that's ever more than a page or too long? I I, I understand you can start an adventure that way, but how do you continue one? And that was the next problem that I confronted in my uh, encounter theory journey. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I completely agree. And especially as a DM, it, it's nice to have that contained sandbox because, I, it, and it always happens every session that I run. I think we're going to get to point this point, and most sometimes we don't even get close. You know, because a lot of times the adventures and the characters in the party will throw you curveballs, and a lot of times they're a lot of fun. And sometimes you get to throw curveballs back, but ultimately you want to keep them, you know, focused on you know the big picture. You know the uh, you you know you have the encounter which is inside the module which is inside the campaign and you're trying to move them along and uh, you know especially uh, sometimes when you're taking written works and then putting on your own homebrew spin or you're tying uh, you know modules together for uh, overall theme. I have come across the you know the questions like well how do I get them from here to there why do they do this why do they want to do that. Why do this? And so with your encounter theory, you know, you break it down and you essentially have, you know, worksheets and it's not just for, you know, fantasy RPG games, you know, you can use it for any RPG games essentially. And so you've got it broken down between, you know, applying, you explain how to imply encounter theory. Uh, you have examples of uh, opponent reaction breakouts, you know, adventure structure organizer. And what I do like about it is, you know, it basically takes it down and helps you organize your thoughts. And it has, uh, you know, broken down boxes of, you know, what is the purpose of this encounter, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and one of the, like, it's all well and good to come up with a theory. Uh, but then I was like, well, how do, how do, <laughs> thank you very much. He, uh, listeners at home, he was holding up a printed out copy of my yes. book. Um, <laughs> But I was certainly like, well, okay, how is this theory going to be applied at the table? So I wanted to come up with some, I call them play plans, but because worksheets just sound so fourth grade. Uh, It's so so much like work. Exactly. Um, I came up with play plans to -hmm. help you design better encounters for your uh, homebrew games or for publication. Um, I include in there an adventure showing you how I apply the theory and how I use the play plans uh, to hopefully help people figure out what's going on. the uh, you kept saying move them along, um, and, and let me ask you a question. What do you mean by move them along? Well, it, essentially, it's kind of like how you explained in uh, Ravenloft. You know, you give them the bait. Sometimes they take it. Sometimes they they start going down that you know that trail, and then you you know, for example, they come across the you know the dead body with the real letter from the Burgermeister. Yeah. Uh, same thing, you know, the old, you know, as you discussed, you know, the old, you're sitting in a tavern, a guy walks in, you know, moving and moving along the plots and say, and, and et cetera. So sometimes when you're moving the people along and what I like about your encounters, like, you know, what is the purpose? You know, they, you know, what, what, what is going to link, you know, a to B to C. Okay. I got you now. Yeah. Yes. And I mean, I, I would tell you, um, you know, in my opinion, if the players are chasing something and having fun, 
that's kind of okay. And again, one of the problems with a lot of pre-published adventures is they're not written in such a way that uh, if you want to do C instead of B, you can do that. Um, like I was reading the newest fifth edition D and D release, uh, Baldur's Gate: Descent into Avernus, mm-hmm. and I'm like, you know, 15 pages in, and the geniuses at Wizards of the Coast. And I mean that sincerely. I'm not being sarcastic. There are geniuses who work at Wizards of the Coast. Um, I've got some opinions. Let me tell you. I, yeah, no. <laughs> but they they say we assume that you go from here to there. I think I want to say it's, we assume you go to the ship next, then a mansion and Mm -hmm. like, that's it. And to, and the thread moving you from your current location to the ship, to the mansion, I think is perilously thin. Um, and again, I understand at a D and D table as part of the social contract, you could probably just say, Hey, the next encounter is here. Will you guys just go there? And a lot of players would just do it. Um, but I would say that that was a weak spot of design on the part of wizards of the coast. Like you should mm-hmm. be empowering players to let them do what they want and not saying, well, you have to go here cause that's where the adventure is. Um, and, uh, like, so far, I've I've read about a, a quarter of Descent to Avernus, and there's a lot of things I really like in it, but I really have a hard time with how railroady it is and how it just says you have to go from A to B to C to D. And what I do in Encounter Theory is I say, okay, I'm not going to tell you where you have to go, but I'm going to give you leads that take mm-hmm. you from encounter to encounter to encounter, and you can follow them or you can not. You know, like a good encounter often will have more than one lead, and it doesn't matter where you go. I've planned for all of it. And uh, again, I feel like you should be planning just enough to get you through. No long character backgrounds, no long histories, just enough to see what the characters are going to do. That's why I call it encounter theory, because Mm. everything that takes place at the role playing game table is either an interaction between characters in the setting and characters and other characters. And those are encounters. Uh, And if you're a designer, it is in improving encounters that you will have the most impact. Um, did I answer your question? <laughs> yes. And I do kind of like it, you know, and it is kind of interesting. You talk about, you know, a lot of the, you know, RPG, you know, stories are, are written, you know, based on novels, you know, and um, listeners, if they want to go to listen to plot points, you know, you, you talk about this um, in, in good detail and, you know, it, it essentially, <sighs> You want the characters to make them think that they're doing what they want to do, but they get, you know, but in the back of your mind, they're doing exactly what you want them to do, you know, to, to have a good time. And, you know, essentially what you want to try and do is create, you know, essentially, um, you know, their own quote unquote, you know, uh, life adventure TV series, more or less, you know, where they're the stars of the stars of the show and, and, uh, essentially almost make, uh, their own, basically creating their own novel as they go along. Does that make sense? I would say so. And I, I think you're highlighting what makes role playing games a radical and engaging new medium, uh, which is it's group storytelling. Uh, I ha- I've compared it to myth. Um, mm-hmm. It used to be like if you were going to tell a story that uh, made sense of your life, if it was, if it was ancient Egypt, uh, you had to be the pharaoh or a priest, and that was it. Um, and today you can do that at, on a Sunday night around your table. You can tell stories of gods and monsters, and the TSR police aren't going to come and stop you. No. <laughs> there, yes, you, you do um, – have a, a lot of information in regards to TSR. So let's kind of use that as a segue. Sure. You know? So, uh, you know, you, so you've got the encounter theory in the books. It helps you write these adventures. But what the other thing that I really enjoyed listening to your seminars and uh, also listening to, to a number of your episodes on plot points is that um, you had me at third edition creation of a masterpiece. <laughs> and I am a, I'm on our podcast. I am the D and D guy. You know, along with uh, Jeff and Jim, and uh, and I like to, you know, talk about you know recent things that are coming out and, and all that kind of fun stuff, and and it is kind of interesting. I started playing when I was in sixth grade, yeah, no, no fifth grade, yeah, about you know fifth sixth grade, the golden was, age. Yes, the golden age. You know, where you you had the dice and you would take a crayon and you color in the numbers. You know, on your on your plastic dice, play it at lunchtime, and I can't remember the first time I played, honestly, it's pretty bad. But, uh, a lot of, a lot of times people say, oh, I can remember this, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I don't remember that, but I, I remember I had a really good time. I played it up through my mid twenties. Um, and then for, you know, that, and then in the mid nineties, 
I can almost find nobody to play. And of course, I was living overseas too. I was stationed overseas. So, can I ask and, where you were? Mm, uh, well, I was stationed in Spain uh, for a couple of years and Rode to Spain, and then after that, in, in uh, La Maddalena, Italy. Oh wow, that, Italy! I hear was great. It's, were Air Force, Army. Yes, uh, Navy. Navy. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So it was a. Uh, so we would spend times on weekends playing role playing games and etc. And I had reached the point where. Eh, I think I'm done. Second edition, and I did the worst thing possible. I was coming back to the States. I was done. And I had this big box of Dungeons and Dragons, and I gave it to my buddy, and I said, Here you go, pal. And I thought I was pretty much done, you know, essentially <laughs> for role playing. Then uh, let's fast forward two years. That was 98 when I came back into the States. But I can remember this year 2000. I'm in the mall when they still had. Walden books and V. Dalton's. <laughs> well, let me tell you, Sonny, we had bookstores. Yes. So, and I remember standing in there, it had been several years since I had done anything D&D or, or actually touched Dungeons and & Dragons. And I'm standing there and I'm looking at the new releases up on the wall. And there is, you know, the, you know, the famous book, Dungeons & Dragons, you know, with the little lock, you know, tome on it. And I was looking at it, and I was like, Dungeons & Dragons? What? That doesn't look like Dungeons & Dragons. So I picked it up, I started looking, and I was like, oh, third edition. And I started opening it up, and I was looking <laughs> at it. I'm like, you know what? This is actually pretty good. The art was spot on. Oh, that art. You know, the, the print was great. They did away with thieves, and they had this thing called Rogue. Ooh. And they had Barbarian. I went, oh, cartoon. Barbarian. And then the Ranger, and I, and I started looking through it. I was like, you know what? I'm going to buy this book. Of course, this is the year 2000, right? <laughs> 20 bucks, well spent. 20 Came bucks, well spent. With the character generator on a CD-ROM. I still have it. So, a couple weeks go by. I started talking to my old fraternity brother from school. And I said, hey, you know what? I got a confession to make. Remember Dungeons & Dragons? They got a new edition out. And I actually bought the book nerd alert hmm. and he starts laughing he says you know what i just bought that book two weeks ago well same thing walking in the store looking at it what is this and then as you know my love affair with dungeons and dragons started all over again except this time it started as an you know more of a mature in hey, air you, quotes. Had, you had money then to spend on it and I, and I had money to spend on it yeah exactly so i love the fact that you are researching the sale of TSR and you're writing a book, you're on the uh, George RR R. Martin plan of not meeting a deadline and having 4,000 words. So, well, so a couple things. <laughs> um, so I've been writing the book for just over two years. Uh, yes. And it started out because my editor at geek and sundry was like, somebody needs to write an article about the fact that TSR used to exist and that Wizards of the Coast didn't always make Dungeons & Dragons. Being the Wisconsin guy, I was like, I'll do it. So off I went. And uh, yes. I and it, wrote... Go ahead, sorry. I'm sorry. And that is a good point, too. That's the other thing that intrigued me and started me looking into, into things because I noticed, hey, this isn't TSR. This is <laughs> Wizards of the Coast. Who the hell is Wizards of the Coast? But anyways, continue. I'm yeah. sorry. That's okay. So I got some amazing material for that article yes. and not everything was able. And my one article became three, but even then I couldn't fit all the amazing stuff in. And I'm like, well, we'll write a short book, 20, 30,000 words off I go. I'm here two, just over two years later. And so I've mm -hmm. written, I'm going to say 160,000 words, but which to, to put that in compare uh, comparison, the Da Vinci code is a hundred thousand words long, like a standard thriller is a hundred thousand words. <laughs> uh, so I, I've ended up separating my book into two. Um, mm. Everything that takes place in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin and involves TSR is one book. And then everything that is Wizards of the Coast, third edition, Seattle is another book. And uh, the TSR book I'm going to guess I'm within a week or two of having it done. Um, I would hope that by December, by rather by the, yeah, by the end of December, I would hope by the end of December, if we were having this conversation, I could tell you who's publishing it. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, things on that front are, are both nearing completion and becoming very exciting. Um, but the, 
thing that happened over the last two years is TSR folk and Wizards of the Coast folk both, A, opened up and really spoke the truth because this all happened 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. And people are just kind of like, whatever, I'm just going to say it. Uh, B, people just started sending me stuff. Um, really? It was, it, after, this, this happened after Gen Con, so this will be new to you probably. Okay. After Gen Con, a source sent me 20 years of TSR sales data. Um, everything from 1979 through 1999 uh, was the sales data I had. And we'd never mm-hmm. seen this before. Like, no one ever actually knew how many copies of second edition Dungeons & Dragons were sold. And there was a fascinating tale hidden in that data, which was this. And there's a lot of stories, but this is the one that I think is the most interesting. If you take Advanced Dungeons & Dragons... And yes. add the sales of all of its core books to the sales of second edition Dungeons and Dragons. Mm-hmm. And then you add that to the second edition revised that came out in, I believe, 1995. And then you took that pile of sales and compared it to the sales of basic D&D in the early 1980s. Basic D&D was a bigger pile. Mm-hmm. than all of those other things. And it just never occurred. Like, I'd never even imagined it that like back in the early 1980s, that basic Dungeons and Dragons, those red boxes yes. and those basic editions, that that was actually more popular than AD&D might have ever been. Um, and I grew up playing AD&D. It sounds like you played a lot of second edition yes. AD&D. But the sales mm-hmm. numbers say like maybe they should have stopped making advanced Dungeons and Dragons and gone back and doubled down on Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, you know what? Uh, that is pretty amazing. I, I did listen to your episode on plot points where you you, oh, good. you, 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 you uh, talked all about all that. And it does make me sit there and think because, you know, the basic Larry Elmore, Red Dragon, I had that box, you know, and I gave it away. <laughs> I wish I had it still. But, um, you know, and I sat there and I, I and it, it makes sense. It's very basic. I mean, you play a dwarf, you're a dwarf. Elf, elf. Human, you can be, you know, thief wizard, whatever, et cetera. It's very simple. It's very straightforward. And it's like, here you go. And then that's how I started out playing D and D. And then they came basic and then they came out. Oh my gosh. Before the lost city loved it. <laughs> uh, so then they come out with this expert. Like, well, what is expert? Well, I guess it's a step above basic D and D. So we started playing an expert and we go into there and, and then all of a sudden, I get this player's handbook, and I come across this advanced Dungeons and Dragons. What is this? Well, this must be the sophisticated version of Dungeons and Dragons, because now you have races, you have classes, you have it, it gets a little bit more complex, and um, it has all this other things that the basic and the expert and the, you know eventually the companion set you know didn't have. And so I could see a lot of people sticking with the basics and the experts. And because it's just a sim- you know, very simple, fun game to play. Uh, I, when I go to Gen Con, you may have played it too. There is a there is always a couple keep on the borderlands. And you just go in and you're basic. Boom. You start. It's really easy. And you go in and you play for several hours. And then you don't finish the game. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, it that revelation made me start considering that perhaps just perhaps um a simpler version of dungeons and dragons will be more successful like and if, if wizards mm-hmm. of the coasts uh wizards of the coast has said that uh the last two years for dungeons and dragons have been the best years in the history ever which means that currently wizards of the coast is outselling those early 1980s modules if yeah. uh, if everything is true um mm-hmm. And uh, it's worth considering if the Dungeons and Dragons that can break out into popular culture is simply one that was simpler than the ones that you you and I really grew up in the heat, it sounds like, Mm -hmm. of second edition and third edition. And I certainly always would have described Dungeons and Dragons as a more complex simulationist game. But Mm -hmm. I I didn't discover basic D&D until 11 months ago. Um, And when Mm -hmm. I did, I was like, this is amazing. Like, it blew my mind. I was like, I can understand, like, this is so much fun. I would totally play this right now. And the rules cyclopedia from 1991, which collated all that, uh, collected all that knowledge rather, uh, is such an amazing book. Like it, it plays beautifully at the table. Like the index is amazing. Everything is just so brief and easy to find. And I'm like, okay, I can totally understand why this is, took off. But I think it's worth considering, especially for people of our generation, that maybe just maybe D and D does need to be simpler if it's going to become a popular thing in mass culture. I think so. I think so today. I, I would definitely agree. Um, I think uh, essentially the overall culture, uh, the instantaneous gratification, 
you know, um, uh, you know, a lot of things that people talk about, they love the D and D encounters. They, they love the, you know, like the, the pathfinder sessions where you just show up at the bookstore and you sit down for two hours, you're given a character, here's the encounters and boom, you're done. And then maybe if you show up next week, it'll be, you know, step seven of the long path of just, you know, things that they put together. And I think, it, you know, we're so distracted by so many things these days, you know, I think uh, there's a satisfaction that a lot of people get when they can just say, you know what, I want to play. I can't get the group together. You know, uh, we can't meet on a, this time. We can't do this. They can go down to, you know, the renaissance of the RPG stores, which are surviving on, you know, bringing people in to play is essentially, you know, instead of just having the books and selling things to them, you know, now they have these large sections of tables, you know, and it's not just, you know, RPG or Dungeon and Dragon Knights, you know, they'll, they'll mix it up with other games and board games where you, you don't need a group set group to agree on a time. You can just go there, sit down, hammer, hammer some uh, RPG and role playing out and then go home and move on to the next one or go pick, then go pick up the kids for soccer. You know, it's a, it, it, it is a, a good, a good basic satisfaction. And, and that is probably part of uh, why fifth edition is taking off. I think, um, with the third edition in 3.5, which I'm still, you know, old hankering, um, uh, you know, uh, I still play it and we still have a group and we still, we still play it. I, I still like it because, even though I enjoyed the basic D and D and the expert and all that kind of fun stuff, second edition was great because it kind of expanded on, you know, the advanced D and D, but I always had problems with things like pole arm. Well, you can you can have a halberd, you can have a guisarm, you can have this other fancy French thing I can't pronounce, but, uh, they just do D 12, Yeah, you know? <laughs> and, and the, the other thing was I, I did love about the secondary skills in the second edition D and D is like, Hey, you can be a Boyer Fletcher background. Hey, you can be a, a armor, you know, you know, armor Smith background. It's like, okay, well that's good because that would explain how you can fix stuff. And then, you know, when you roll that one critical miss and house rules say your bowstrings broke, how are you going to fix it? Well, <laughs> Hey, I'm a Boyer Fletcher, <laughs> you know, it's great. And, uh, and the one thing, and this is good because, uh, you do, you do get to, uh, you have talked to, you know, for example, Monty cook, we can talk a little bit later. He's an interesting cat, isn't he? And, uh, I, I do love the fact that, you know, tweet cook and skip Williams, you know, fueled by, you know, Peter Atkinson, of course, um, and rich Baker and rich Baker. Yes. He made, he made the barbarian and the sorcerer, as I recall. Yes. And that's, and that those are great, uh, characters, by the way. So the, what, so they took it and they actually gave it. Hey, this does slashing damage. This does bludgeoning damage. And it's like it all. And I'm like, I love it. Finally, there's a reason why you would have a halberd as opposed to a glare gnome hook <laughs> hammer. Yeah, and because you could do these special things, and they added feats. And you you talk about it in your in your seminars and also in your your plot points. Um, you know, podcast yourself about how they you know you know, mix thing, you know, money, mix things up. And, uh, you know, you couldn't touch some things were sacred cows that they couldn't touch other things they can go into. And I love the skills because, and I, and I love the feats. Uh, there's way too many spells, but that's okay. <laughs> but, uh, and I think sometimes people get intimidated if, if they played fourth edition or fifth edition and they come back to this and like, well, there's, there's all these feats. I don't know what to do. It's like, no, 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 just take it easy. You know, just go level by level. But um, and, and, and what I liked about it is the fact that when you played basic expert or AD and D, you know, for example, basic expert, you're an, an elf, was an elf, was an elf, was an elf, fighter, 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 uh, AD and D, um, Thaco, let's 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 uh, break out the calculators and why do things go negative? I don't know, you know, <laughs> and they simplified it with the D twenty, which I love, and the open license was a genius idea. And so you can make 10 fighters in third edition or 3.5 and all 10 fighters can be different. Every character you can make, you can basically customize and specialize. And I noticed in the fifth edition now, cause I still, I don't play fifth edition, but I have to for Gen Con. Yeah. But I, I do, I am familiar with it. I'll do a lot. look at the rule books. Uh, my nephew has been turned on to it. You know, I've helped him out, get it, get really super excited about it. And, um, my sister thanks me. <laughs> um, so yeah, now there's, well, how, how old is your nephew? 
Uh, he is 16. Yeah, I mean, all the all He's of the D- research D- club is, at school. I yeah, mean, you know. it, it improves reading, it improves writing, it improves test scores. It's crazy. Vocabulary. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, I, yeah. how many people know what a portcullis is? You know, yeah. I've never gained before. Yeah. You know, so you can go ahead and you create, you know, it's, well, the fifth edition, they're coming up now, these variants. I'm like, well, you know what? You could have just made that character in 3.5 if you wanted, you know, or <laughs> in the background. But, you know, so it, what it, so when you're talking about creation of a masterpiece, I loved it. And of course, I, I always wondered, and I started, I went back on my own a little bit to read about books. And, you know, I got the old, um, was it 30 Years of Adventure, Celebrations of Dungeons and Dragons with the intro by Vin Diesel. And, uh, and I sit there and I look at it and I'm like, yeah, what did happen with TSR? Why did that <laughs> fail? You had great artists like Clive and Elmore and their icons, like iconic TSR. And, you know, who is this Wizards of the Coast? Who's this Peter Atkinson guy? <laughs> and, uh, what does Pokemon have to do with this? And, uh, <laughs> looking into it, I, I did my own amateurish research, but the best part is you, Ben, you summed it up. <laughs> well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, yeah, uh, that story of what happened there is is complicated, but I've I've heard it summarized uh, aptly by two different people. Okay, um, John Ratliff, who was uh, an editor at TSR, and went on to write the definitive version. Of, I shouldn't say definitive, the definitive critical work on J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit. Um, he said, "You can only make so many mistakes before it ends up killing you." Mm-hmm. And uh, Jim Falone, who was a director of sales at TSR, he said that uh, TSR felt a need to innovate, so it engaged in a number of uh, endeavors which ultimately failed, like TSR West, which was their attempt to build a comic book company. That mm-hmm. gave the company debt. The company yeah. then uh added to its problems by making a large number of products that literally lost the company money. For example, every Dark Sun adventure that they ever sold, which came with a flip book inside it, sold, mm-hmm. lost the company a buck per game. Uh, the Encyclopedia Magica, which you know you might remember from the mid-90s, yes. uh, and was amazing and beautiful and fantastic, barely made any money at all. It sold really well, but the book itself was so expensive, it wasn't profitable for the company to make. So the company started borrowing money from Random House, through a very complicated method that I won't bore, bore you about right now, but they borrowed money from Random House. They didn't pay it back. And then on top of that, the, every January, they would try and get every hobby store in America to pre-buy all its TSR material. Um, oh, yes. The business and, plan. This is a this is an amazing business plan. Yes. yes please continue. So, it just blew me away when you told me about it. I know. When I heard well, this, not I me. believe it. Yeah. But uh, – <laughs> So they would get everybody to commit to making purchases that year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they would give the hobby stores like, you know, a discount for doing so. TSR would then take these contracts they have with hobby stores and sell them to banks. And the banks would say, OK, but again, we're going to take a lower percentage here. So TSR, on the, on the one hand, it gets all the money it's going to get from the hobby trade in January. So it is this pile of money it can use to budget for the year. The downside is, A, they're making 18 cents less on every dollar they sell in the hobby trade, which is a lot. B, uh, it gives them no room at all to be fleet on their feet or responding to the industry. When Magic the Gathering came out and uh, Vice President of Creative Services Jim Ward decided that TSR had to make a response, which is a game called Spellfire, he was told, you can do it, but you can spend no money. Like mm-hmm. you will have a budget of like nothing to do this, um, which is why if you are familiar with Spellfire, it had recycled art from prior TSR products. Yes. Now, Jim Ward went out and he said, we have such beautiful art. Why not use it again? Which sounds reasonable uh, mm-hmm. until, you know, the cust- customers were not necessarily persuaded by that. But then when you hear, oh, you had no budget, then you're like, ah, that makes sense. And of course, Jim Ward couldn't go out and say, well, we have no budget. So that's why we're doing it. But yes. all of this, this you have products that aren't making money you have debt accumulating you're making 18 percent less on every dollar you sell Uh, eventually all that just comes due when uh random their debt with random house gets so big random Mm -hmm. house sues them returns a bunch of product tsr fires a bunch of people for about three months they're not allowed to make any product at all because they also weren't paying their printer and they let their printer become their landlord and they signed an exclusivity agreement with their printer allowing that so they couldn't go anywhere else to print their books 
and then uh, Wizards yeah. of the Coast comes in and buys them. Exactly. Um, they be, they came so constricted by their own enormity in business plans that they couldn't react to disruptors in the market. You know, like yeah, Wizards when of the I, Coast. I was like. When I started, I was like, there must be an easy one sentence version of what happened. Two years later, I'm like, there's not a one sentence version, but I can probably do it in less than three minutes if I'm really hurried. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I don't know if that was three minutes or not, but I, I think I summarized it okay. <laughs> I'll take it. It is probably better than uh, my uh, uh, beer uh, beer influenced rendition several months ago when I talked about Gen Con and your seminar. But uh, it's probably more coherent, too, by the way. <laughs> the beer might be more fun, though. <laughs> Yes, yeah, but it, it is amazing. You know, they they lock themselves into this. What it seems to be a great plan. They should be making lots of money because you're in the market. And as your big question goes, you know, where did the money go? Where is the money? So uh, my answer to that would be a couple things. It would be uh, <laughs> if you consider that TSR claimed to gross forty million dollars. In 1996, the last complete year before they failed, um, they probably only brought in 33% of that because a cut goes to their distributor, a cut goes to the retailers. So if they're bringing in 10 to $15 million, they probably have more than that in debt because I know for a fact that they had about $9.5 million they owed Random House in late 1996. And I uh, would imagine they probably had between $1 and $5 million in other outstanding debt from things like starting a comic book company. So when you look at that and you realize that like your debt equals 100% of your net, that's mm-hmm. a hard place to be in. Uh, and it looks like they looked, they started looking for buyers in late 1996, early 1997. Um, and it's just a lot of bad decisions accumulating over time. It, it, it puzzled me initially, though. They put out these bragging press uh, releases where mm-hmm. they're like, we had the best year ever. We made over $40 million. Suck it, Wizards of the Coast. And then 18 <laughs> months later, they're bought by Wizards of the Coast. Like They called out Peter Atkinson, CEO of Wizards, being like, we noticed mm-hmm. you closed your role-playing game division. Sucks to be you. Um, yes. So it, 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 just, it is... Yeah, it, it, and it's also interesting to, to listen to Peter talk about eventually how he made that purchase happen through the, his attorney and, and, and et cetera. And, and you know, I'm, I'm actually pretty thankful that he did because eventually, you know, everything that Guy Gax and Arneson and everybody through all the years at TSR, and you've got to meet a lot of these people and you're interviewing them for your podcast and you're writing this book with them. And, and I, I wish I was up there in, in uh, Wisconsin <laughs> to do this, but. I, I could do without the snow, and, <laughs> but uh, I do know that uh, you you do have a hard out this evening, and I've got so much more I would like to ask in questions. But let's do. I like to play a game sometimes when we have guests okay. on our podcast. I Sounds give them good. you do quick answer, quick answer questions, right? All right, let's do it. All right, here we go. Dragonlance. Will they ever get the Game of Thrones TV or movie deal? No. Oh, oh man. All right, what edition Dungeons and Dragons, if you had to pick one to continue to play for the rest of your life and none others, which would it be? Uh, basic. Basic. Would you be a DM or a player? Uh, I'd like to be a player, but I'd probably be a DM. Yeah, see, uh, side note on tangents. I used to be player all the time, and then I got stuck with DMing, and I've, yep. I've loved it ever since. But the, there's, there's three kinds of people who are DMs. People who have a story to tell, people who are rules lawyers, and people who do it because no one else will. And the third type are always the best. Uh, I fit all three. I'm perfect. <laughs> okay. And then uh, one class to play. Fighter. Basic. Fighter. Okay. Uh, another one. Have you ever made a pitch to Enzo Ferrari? No. No. <laughs> All right. I have the beholder. Did you get a chance to see that documentary? I have not seen it yet. Ironically, considering that, like I've read the art book on D and I haven't seen the documentary yet. I should get around to it. You should. It's very good. Uh, I got, uh, every year when I go to Gen Con, I talk to Larry Elmore and I make an ass of myself <laughs> and I, I did it again this year. Cause I went, I bought it. And then the guy distracted me. I said, can Larry sign it? And he's oh yeah. And he distracted me. Hey, you know, he paints everything. It's not digital. I'm like, Duh, that's why I'm here. <laughs> and uh, I mean, when I think Dungeons and Dragons in my mind, it's Larry and, you know, Clive's art and all, all yeah. the four horsemen. It's all their art that comes to my mind. And you basically caught it very well with Monty Cook because you love the art that Monty Cook does. I love the art that Monty, Monty Cook gets. And I'll tell you what, I couldn't do Pathfinder because I couldn't picture people's hands bigger than their head. 
<laughs> Granted, the artist is talented. I love the guy. He does do some good stuff. But I, I just have, a, you know, art is so important to a product. And if it doesn't have the right art, it will go, it can go sideways yep. for you. Yep. You know, as you talk with Spellfire, you know, in the cards. But, uh, okay, so, Ben, uh, thank you very much for giving me uh, some some of your busy time. I wish you very good luck on uh, your book. Uh, when it comes out, give me a chance to yeah, pick up the conversation again. Yeah, Remember well, us little people. Well, hey, if you want to talk again in, like, February or something, that'd be great. I'm going to Barcelona in February, so I'd love to hear some tips. Ah, uh, Barcelona. Alka, yes. yes, Las Ramblas, I'll help you out. Barcelona okay. was my favorite city until I went to Prague. Oh, wow. That's amazing. It's well, you great. have a good night. Thank you so much, Blake. It was great to be here. Thank you, Ben. Oh, and I guess I should say uh, Encounter Theory is my book. Find it on Drive Through RPG. Plot Points Podcast is my podcast. Go check that out, too. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ben. Bye bye. Okay, we ready? Sound good in there? All right, cool. All right, uh, Alan Sherman, 12 Days of Christmas parody for History of Bad Ideas, take one. On the first day of Christmas, Hobie gave to me a Japanese transistor radio on the... What? Really? Um, all right. Okay, all right, I, I can do it, okay. Uh, Alan Sherman, 12 Days of Christmas parody for History of Bad Ideas, take two. On the first day of Christmas, Hobie gave to me a history of bad ideas, I owe you. On the second day of Christmas, Hobie gave to me green polka dot pajamas and a history of bad ideas, I... What? R really? Well, that too? Um, okay, all right. All right, okay, we'll, uh, we'll take it from the top again. All right, uh, Alan Sherman, 12 Days of Christmas Parody for History of Bad Ideas, take three. <sighs> On the first day of Christmas, Hobie gave to me a history of bad ideas, I owe you. On the second day of Christmas, Hobie gave to me two IOUs and a history of bad ideas, I owe you. It's a Nakashuma. On the third day of Christmas, Hobie gave to me a counter book with the name of my insurance man, two IOUs, and a... Hit now what? Are you serious? They didn't get the calendar book? Uh, okay, uh, all right, fine, fine, fine. All right, can, can you just dub this in? Just, just dub this in. I don't want to start from the beginning again, okay? All right, all right, cool. Let's see, where am I? Uh, ba, 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 ba. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Three IOUs, two IOUs, and a history of bad ideas, IOU. It's better than money. On the fourth day of Christmas, Hobie gave to me. Are you... Really? Nothing? Not the whole thing? I mean, what the fuck? The... What the fuck am I doing this song for then? Uh, all right, fine. I'm. You know what? I'm done. I'm done. I just let's just get this over with, okay? Twelve IOUs, eleven IOUs, ten IOUs, nine IOUs, eight IOUs, seven IOUs, six IOUs, five IOUs, four IOUs, three IOUs, two IOUs, and a history of bad ideas. I owe you.